I've made videos before about cleaning faders on Porta Studios. This is a larger fader from a prosumer grade mixer that I'm cleaning for my own use in my home studio. It's a, from a Studio Master 16.8. So this is, I'm not exactly sure what size, I would guess about 200 millimeters long, 20 centimeters long, larger than what you'd find in most Porta Studios. But because it's a bit chunkier, it's gonna be a bit easier for you to see uh, exactly what's going on here. So I'll just show you the entire process of opening this. Sorry about the plane noise in the background. Cleaning it and then putting it back together. Towards the end of the video I will compare the anatomy of a larger fader like this to the circuit board mounted smaller feeders that you would tend to find in multi-track cassette recorders. But with no exceptions I can think of off the top of my head, you're going to have a series of pins along the back that attach this upper metal part to the substrate of the printed circuit board below. Ultimately we're going to want to kind of bend those back using needle nose pliers, but often it's difficult to get any kind of purchase it's going to be difficult to get that off so what I would normally do is get a, a small flathead screwdriver like this uh, one by one so try and drive that underneath and twist a little bit just so there's a good millimeter or so of space between the pin and the substrate with a little bit of space between those pins and the substrate below then I'm going to use needle nose pliers I find that ones that are serrated, they have these sort of teeth on them, are a little bit easier to work with. And you see, I'm just trying to kind of bend around these points here where they were bent already. With all of those loose, then you should be able to pull the circuit board away. Now on this model, you can see that the earth bus is a completely separate piece of metal going through the substrate through these clips and then the, the parts that have solder connections are going through holes and likewise the resistive strip i'm not exactly sure what we would call those connections but there's some sort of manufacturing process so that there's a completely separate part that's kind of bolted onto the substrate it's more common for porter studios to see this is um not quite painted on, but you know, glued on, there would be a thin surface here rather than two separate pieces. But the anatomy is still the same. You've got a common connection to circuit ground here. And then depending on how far up or down the brushes on this moving plastic slider are along this strip, then the resistance will change. And in here, it's typical to have a spring so this brass spring that maintains contact between these brushes below and the conductive parts that will often be separated from the metal casing by a little plastic. I'm not quite sure what to call that. I'll call it a washer. And then the metal pin that goes into the plastic knob on top is usually set into a sort of plastic, what we call that, a shoe. And uh, the brushes are attached to that below. Now this isn't an exceptionally dirty fader, but if I take this isopropanol swab as a nurse might use before an injection and run this across here, look at all that crap. You know, a huge amount of dirt can build up in these. See if I scrape the inside corner of here. I mean, there's quite a lot of crud even in this relatively clean feeder that's accumulated in the corners. And one of the reasons that I would not recommend that you just spray contact cleaner in through the case of the unit that you're working on and into here and move it around is if you only do that, quite often what will happen is that any lint or grit or whatever that was up in these corners will get dislodged and it will actually get in between these conductive surfaces and these metal brushes. And that will mean that the fader feels worse when it moves and it can actually cause cutouts or even if a piece of debris got caught between this brush and the conductive surfaces permanently, it would cause the fader to cut out altogether. The only time that I would not desolder and dismantle these is if the fader basically worked well and felt smooth and looked clean to begin with. Under those circumstances, then what I might do is get uh, the stick from a Q-tip 
so you know something like this i'd maybe pull the cotton bud off there get a clean one of these and wrap it around there and then you could push that in there and kind of clean the surface that way and then once you've done that put some contact cleaner in there and then blow it through with some compressed air and some of the dirty liquids would basically come out through these cracks but in most situations that's a cop out you really are going to see a lot of dirt trapped in all the surfaces of of this so if i get another clean one of this just to demonstrate how much crap builds up on here you know that's the old grease you know there's little flecks of hard stuff in there you know bits of dust bits of skin could be cigarette ash could be anything really and that's just on this little plastic washer if i move that around in here you know there's quite a lot of muck and uh, all of that can affect the performance of the fader we particularly want to get any dirt off the tips of these brushes in a really dirty example you might actually see a little ball of lint and muck caught on the tips of all of these brushes uh, for something like this what did we call this a shoe it could be helpful to get some contact cleaner put that on there get something like an old toothbrush really make sure that you've got debris old grease off of everywhere just a little bit in there before we would think about reassembling that and we could do something similar with these sorts of casings Spray some contact cleaner in there and get in there with a brush to make sure that any muck that's caught particularly in these four corners is out before we start to reassemble so dry off the excess contact cleaner with something like a paper towel isn't going to leave too much residue on the metal surfaces um, sometimes what I'll do is if there's significant erosion like uh, oxidization whatever the brass equivalent is to rust the proper name for that um, if there was any of that there then I might get some low grit sandpaper and some high viscosity motor oil either with a scalpel or with the sandpaper kind of scrape away at any spots of rust that might make the travel of the shoe within the casing not smooth and then I would use more isopropanol or contact cleaner to get any oil residue off there and wipe that with a paper towel before I started to reassemble. Um, as it is, there isn't actually any corrosion. You can see some corrosion on the upper surface here, but there isn't actually any inside. When you reassemble, what you're going to find is that the pattern of these pins means that there's only one way that you can uh, put this back in. Like you see that the pins and the slots don't line up there. But if I turn them round, then those match back up. We need to remember to put the plastic washer back above the tension spring on the mixer shoe. And then it's very obvious on this fader, not so obvious on others, which way round the brush should be. So you can see there's a double brush here that goes on this resistive surface, whereas there's a larger single brush that's going to contact with this round bus bar. Therefore, that must be that way around. So if we've already established that the substrate and the casing go together that way, and that needs to go on like that, then we would put that in that way first. Now, what I would normally do is tighten these pins back with the shoe quite nearby. If you were to tighten this back, with that shoe away from the pin. It sort of depends on how robust the design of the fader is. This one's pretty stiff, but in some of the smaller ones, if I start pushing like this without that inside, the casing is actually so fragile I can end up squishing it and that'll create a tight spot. So when you move this, you'll get to a point where it's tight and it doesn't move properly. Um, so not as important for this particular one, but just to show you, I would put this nearby to that before I start to tighten it. And what I do is I would put one blade, if you like, of the pliers at the diagonally opposite corner and squeeze like this. And then as it gets tighter, then I'm moving 
this blade to underneath there. So, you know, the force is starting off diagonally to push this round and then as it gets so that the pin and the substrate are closer to parallel, then I would squeeze that way rather than that way. I hope that makes sense. You'll see me do it a few times here anyway. And really, I would have wanted to do the opposite one because the other thing that can happen is that you push the substrate over. So I want to tighten them in pairs, really. I'm just talking too much and thinking too little. And, you know, I also want to kind of occasionally pinch like that to make sure that they're tight both sides. So having done a pair in the middle, I would probably go to the far end, make sure that that's shut. Um, pinch like that and then like that. Pinch like that. substrate is centered but yeah I would I would do pins in the center pins at either end and then catch any pairs of pins that haven't already been shot so that already feels okay but I definitely want to put in some sort of electrical lubricant so I'm using this deoxit F100L fader loop so I'll put a little bit on the tracks that is the uh, conductive parts on the substrate either side of the shoe and then I'll put a little bit on the shoe itself just around the part that goes into the plastic knob that's moved by the user. Move that up and down a bit and then I'm going to get same compressed air I've actually got this is the for inflating a camp bed it's just because it's permanently plugged in so I don't have to buy compressed air all the time but I'll blow that uh, lubricant through so there's a thin coating of everything in there. move it again and then that's done so here's a bag of uh, various bits of faders from other units Porter Studios that are broken so that's more of the sort of size that we would be working with and, and you can see that where's the one that I was working on there it would be screwed in from the top surface of the mixer and then there were wires coming from the conductive pins uh, most of these the pins are going to go through the printed circuit board and soldered at the base so these two are just to hold it in place but then we have the electrical connections here but although it's smaller the anatomy is pretty much the same you know we would just open this with the pliers as before um here's the exposed substrate this is what i was talking about it's printed it's not as easy to distinguish between which is the earth bar and which is the resistive part but you can see it's just this kind of carbon surface that's been printed onto the substrate and then connects to metal pins at either end here's an example of a smaller shoe there is still a little plastic washer there is still a little brass spring to maintain the tension between the brushes and the conductive parts on the substrate below the shoe is still plastic the pin onto which the plastic user knob slips is still metal the brushes below are metal it's just a miniaturized version of the same anatomy hope you find that helpful if you're attempting to refurbish something using these sorts of linear potentiometers as opposed to rotating potentiometers. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you again soon.